Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this series is on death, dying, and the future hope. This is our last lesson in that series. It's actually lesson number 14. That happens once in a while. Entitled, All Things New. It's a lesson for December 31 of 2022. And as usual, we'd like to begin with the word of prayer. Our wonderful Father, as we look forward to someday, hopefully, being able to enter that kingdom where we live with you and enjoy the wonderful prospects that you have in mind, may we understand a little bit more about it in our discussion today, and may we, it, it increase our desire to be there is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Does the picture of heaven suggested by scripture seem too good to be true? Nobody's going to comment? No. No, okay. Not to me. Okay. Could the second coming of Jesus Christ leading us to that wonderland actually happen in our lifetimes? Now that might be a little trickier question. What would be included in the new heaven? I mean, we certainly have all the, the things that the Bible has predicted are going to happen before the second coming going on right now, don't we? With regards to that, uh, will it happen in my lifetime? My parents certainly thought it would happen in their lifetime. They thought it would happen early in their lifetime. Yeah. Remember Dr. Maxwell saying yep. that his... Father did. His father and some of his associates thought that it was going to happen so soon that they didn't even have children. Yep. So, so what, yet we wait. Yeah. What would be included in a new heaven and a new earth? Does it mean that God will remake the entire universe? Perhaps it would you could, it'd be easier to see what's not going to be there. Yeah. No okay. courts, no prisons, no... <laughs> yeah, we'll get, we'll, we'll get to all that. You want to go ahead and read for us? Second no, he Peter? won't make an entire new universe. He will not. In my opinion. Second Peter 3, verses 3 to 7. First of all, you must understand that in these last days, some people will appear whose lives are controlled by their own lusts. They will mock you and will ask. He promised to come, didn't he? Where is he? Our ancestors have already died but everything is still the same as it was since the creation of the world. Does that sound familiar to anybody? Mm -hmm. Pure evolution, right? They purposely ignore the fact that long ago God gave a command and the heavens and the earth were created. The earth was formed out of the water and by water, and it was also by water, the waters of the flood, that the old world was destroyed. But the heavens and the earth that now exist are being preserved by the same command of God in order to be destroyed by fire. They are being kept for the day when the good, godless people will be judged and destroyed. American Bible Society. Yeah. Good news. Too. How do you picture heaven in your mind? What will it be like to dwell in the very presence of God? Is that scary? I don't know whether it's scary, but it, it'd be like in the, on this earth having the president or a king or whoever living in your house. Yeah. You know, just kind of like, wow. oh, it's a real person? <laughs> yeah. Ancient Greek philosophy taught that anything that was material or that you could actually touch or feel was bad or evil, while the spiritual things are untouchable and invisible. That was the ancient pagan idea from Plato and others. This idea has spread to Christianity to the point that people have spoken about heaven as if we would be sitting on clouds and playing harps. The Bible speaks about, you've never seen any cartoons or anything like that, have you? People sitting on clouds and playing harps? The Bible speaks about heaven in very concrete terms. Look, for example, at Isaiah 65, 17 to 25. Gordon? From the Good News Bible, the Lord says, I am making a new heaven and new, 
pardon me, I am making a new earth and new heavens. The events of the past will be completely forgotten. Will they really? I hope well, not everything, or we'll have yeah. to do this all again. Be glad and rejoice forever in what I create. The new Jerusalem I make will be full of joy and her people will be happy. I myself will be filled with joy because of Jerusalem and her people. There will be no weeping there, no calling for help. Babies will no longer die in infancy and all people will live out their lifespan. Those who live to be a hundred will be considered young. To die before that would be a sign that I have punished them, that I had punished them. <clears throat> Let me interrupt there for just a second. It's still talking about babies dying and it's talking about people dying after their lifespan. Yeah. So this isn't quite a picture of heaven, is it? Some of this is talking about perhaps what the ancient Jerusalem could have been. Let's see, go ahead. So, um, people? people will build houses and live in them themselves. They will not be used by someone else. They will plant vineyards and enjoy the wine. It will not be drunk by others. Like trees, my people will live long lives. They will fully enjoy the things that they have worked for. The work that they do will be successful and their children will not meet with disaster. I will bless them and their descendants for all time to come. Now here's another example. Uh, in heaven, there's not gonna be any disasters, okay? Verse 24, even before they finish praying to me, I will answer their prayers. Wolves and lambs will eat together. Lions will eat straw as cattle do, and snakes will no longer be dangerous. On Zion, my sacred hill, there will be nothing harmful or evil. Good News Bible. Okay. So the last verse seems to transition to heaven, but before that? Yeah. Well, think of the implications of this passage as outlined in our Bible study guide. One, go ahead. The new, the new earth is God's unique creation, Isaiah 65, 17. God intervenes and creates it because he is the creator. Number two, the sinful past will no longer burden God's servants. Again, Isaiah 65, 17. Number three, Jerusalem will be a place of joy and happiness. We've moved on to verse 18. There will be no weeping and crying in Jerusalem, verse 19. This is all Isaiah 65. No infant mortality or miscarriages will occur. This is 20 and 23. Longevity of the faith, number six, longevity of the faithful is guaranteed. Again, verse 20 and 22. But before life on the earth commences, sinners will die prematurely. That's in 65, 20. Creative work, number seven, creative work will prevail. Houses will be built and vineyards planted. Number eight, peace and prosperity will be secured this is Isaiah 22. There will be no threats of war or destruction. Number nine, people will enjoy life under God's presence and blessings. Isaiah 65, 23. Number 10, prayers will be immediately answered by God. Verse 24. Number 11, new conditions of life in nature will be created. That's the lion and the lamb, etc. Oh, okay. Number 12, Inhabitants will experience the reversal of the covenant curses unto, into abundant blessings, as indicated by the theology of this passage in comparison to the... Deuteronomic. Thank you. Blessings and curses from Deuteronomy 27, 28. Compare with Leviticus 26. That's a if adult you, teachers. Yeah. If you go back, if you have time to go back and review those chapters, Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 27, 26 and 27, you'll okay. see a long list of blessings and curses, blessings and curses. And here, basically Isaiah is saying, this is the way it should have worked out if you experienced all those blessings that are mentioned back there. A careful reading of Isaiah 65, 17 to 25 and all the rest of the Bible surrounding it, make it quite clear that Isaiah was prophesying what Israel could have been like 
if they had carefully followed God's plans for their lives. These prophecies should be compared with the blessings and curses described in Deuteronomy 28. There's a very close parallel. Obviously, Are you suggesting that Israel didn't follow God's plan for their lives? Uh, that's exactly what I'm suggesting. Not just suggesting, but explicitly stating. Yes. Emphasizing. Yes. When they started practicing all the fertility cult, religious practices and so forth, they were certainly not following God's example. Obviously, Israel did not carefully follow God's plans for their lives. Therefore, Isaiah's original prophecies could not come true. So what was God's response? How did God re respond to all of that? God transferred his special blessings and care from the nation of Israel to the Christian church. And where do we read about that? That would be in the book of Acts, isn't it? A little bit at the end of the Gospels, but mostly the book of Acts. Matthew 28, we read 18 to 20. Jesus drew near and said to them, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Go then to all peoples everywhere and make them my disciples. Baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit and teach them to obey everything I have commanded you and I will be with you always to the end of the age from our Good News Bible. And 1 Peter 2, 9, but you are the chosen race, the king's priests, the holy nation, God's own people. And where did we read those words before? Do you remember? Those are straight from Exodus 19, verse 8. God made those same statement to the children of Israel camped at the foot of Mount Sinai. They were, they were called out of darkness into his own marvelous light. And now he's saying, I'm now applying this to the Christian church. 2 Peter 3, 13, but we wait for what God has promised, new heavens <clears throat> and a new earth where righteousness will be at home. And then Ellen White concluding, and the Bible, the inheritance of the saved is called a country, Hebrews 11, 14 to 16. There the heavenly shepherd leads his flock to fountains of living waters. The tree of life yields its fruit every month and the leaves of the tree are for the service of the nations. Um, hey, you have any idea what kind of fruit's gonna grow on those trees or that tree? Good. Mangoes. <laughs> yeah, the people in Jamaica are sure it's 12 different kinds of mangoes. I'm sure there's gonna be a variety. It's, it's gonna be fantastic. We have so much good fruit available right now here in Southern California. There are ever flowing streams, clear as crystal, and beside them waving trees cast their shadows upon the paths prepared for the ransom to the Lord. There the wide-spreading plains swell into hills of beauty, and the mountains of God rear their lofty summits. On the, those peaceful plains, beside those living streams, God's people, so long pilgrims and wanderers, shall find a home. This is Great Controversy 675. And Ellen White saw all of that in vision. She wasn't just dreaming this up. She saw it. Can you imagine what the future looks like to those who do not believe in heaven? Could it ever be possible that the current conditions in this world will be transformed into righteousness? You know that there's a lot of people who believe that there's going to be a government set up over in Israel and that Jesus is going to come down and he's going to rule from there and the, the, the wonderful world we live in is just going to be transformed into great righteousness. So it's a variation on the theory of evolution. Yes. We're going to get better. Yeah. yeah. It seems like we're deteriorating. Yes. <clears throat> God has a very clear plan for his faithful followers. Oh, right. Can, the higher, they, higher than the highest thought can reach is God's ideal for his children. Godliness, goodness, God-likeness, that is, is the goal to be reached. Ellen White, Book Education, page 18. Seventh-day Adventists have built much of their theology around the idea that there is a throne room and a sanctuary in heaven. Is that true? What do we know about that temple of God? Revelation 15, 5 and 8. After this I saw the temple in heaven open with a sacred tent in it. The temple was filled with smoke from the glory and power of God. 
and no one could go into the temple until the seven plagues brought by the seven angels had come to an end. That's Good News Bible. Okay, so clearly Revelation 15 says there is a temple. And something about, sounds like God is dwelling there, doesn't it? Yeah. If you sort of read between the lines. Go ahead. Bible study guide says compare Revelation 7, 9 through 15 and or with Revelation 21, 3 and 22. How can we harmonize the description of the great multitude of the redeemed serving God, quote, day and night in his temple, unquote, with a statement of John, that John, quote, saw no temple, unquote, in the New Jerusalem, the latter being from Revelation 21, 22 in the New King James. And that's from the Bible study guide for Monday. Okay, so let's look at that place where it says there's no temple. Myra. Revelation 7, verses 9 to 15. After this, I looked, and there was an enormous crowd. No one could count all the people. They were from every race, tribe, nation, and language. They stood in front of the throne of the Lamb, dressed in white robes, holding palm branches in their hands. They called out in a loud voice, Salvation comes from our, our God who sits on the throne, from the Lamb and from the Lamb. All the angels stood around the throne and the elders and the four living creatures. Then they threw themselves face downwards in front of the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen. Praise, glory, wisdom, thanksgiving, honor, power, and might belong to our God forever and ever. Amen. I want to stop there for a moment and just ask you a question. Why are we all falling on our faces? Is to that, hide our, our face from God. Do we need to hide our face from God? Not at this point. I hope not. Not at the point we're talking about here when we're in heaven, yeah. yeah. Uh, this is the way that people, the, the people behaved in those days, and I think that's what John is reflecting. Go ahead. You're saying in John's day, John yeah. the Revelator's day. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. Okay. I don't think that necessarily is the only way because the reason I'm asking that is because if you read through the Bible in various places, every time God appears to someone, he says, and people fall down, he says, pick up, stand up, I want to talk to you. Yeah. So Face to face. Yeah. Well, and that, didn't they do that, even the kings and pharaohs? and yep. I mean, that was their culture. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, One of the verse elders? 13. One of the elders asked me, who are these people dressed in white robes and where do they come from? I don't know, sir. You do, I answered. I don't know, sir. You do, I answered. Okay. Now he, so he's saying, he, I don't know, but you do. Yeah. yeah. Uh, he said to me, these are the people who have come safely through the terrible persecution. They have washed their robes and made them white with the blood of the Lamb. That is why they stand before God's throne and serve him day and night in his temple. He who sits on the throne will protect them with his presence. Good okay, news. so there's another mention of the temple, right? Yeah. Sounds like there's going to be a lot of people there, doesn't it? Yeah. Revelation 21, 3, 22 says, I heard a loud voice speaking from the throne. Now God's home is for human beings. He will live with them, and he shall be his and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them, and he will be their God. I did not see a temple in this city. Because of its temple is the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb. Well, notice the expression there in the city. Now if you if the Lord God is the temple, how are we going to be in the temple? So how can both of those prophecies be true? Well, there's a very interesting passage from Ellen Harmon White. This is before she was married. Her first vision in which she traveled to heaven and was shown heaven. And this is what she said. Then we began to look at the glorious things outside of the city. Outside of the city. 
Mount Zion was just before us, and on the mount sat a glorious temple. Where is it? Outside of the city. And about it were seven other mountains on which grew roses and lilies, and I saw the little ones climb, or if they chose, use their little wings and fly to the top of the mountains and pluck the never-failing flowers. So notice the term outside the city. The essay, this essay was not written for publication and so forth. So, so that was written in 1846. 1846, that's correct. Clearly, in the book of Revelation, the focus is on the one to whom our worship is directed as opposed to some kind of building or temple. Why do you suppose it was, she decided it shouldn't be published at that point, and later was published. Why, why do you suppose it wasn't, wasn't to be published then? They probably wouldn't have been able to understand. She was a young all. girl. She was a young girl, and, and not only that, some of the things she said, including this, would people say, where in the world did she get that? We hadn't, they had no idea of understanding what her background or, or how this all happened and so forth. So it's better to keep it under wraps for a little bit until you get a little clearer picture of the whole, picture, the whole thing. Um, however, Revelation 7.14 describes the temple time of persecution, terrible. a terrible time of persecution, I'm sorry, that will precede our inheritance of heaven. Why is that necessary? We're going to go to a place where everything is peaceful and harmony and, 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 and loving and kind and generous. Why do we have to have a time of terrible trouble before, in order to get there? Why do we have to take gold and get it to a certain point before it's beautiful? Okay, does that mean that... Uh, Something needs to happen to us. So, really, there there needs to be a demonstration of what Satan's kingdom is like. Yeah. It's not that we need to go through a time of trouble. It's that it, to the We've entire universe, in, including the other everyone here on this earth, and everyone and all the angels and other beings, need to see what Satan would do if this world were given to him. That's right. And at that same time, they're going to see that God's faithful people are going to stand faithful no matter what Satan does to them. So they're going to see both sides through these final moments. Numerous passages in Scripture describe the ideal situation when God will dwell with his people and they will belong to him. Revelation, let's look at just, let's look at Revelation 21.3. Uh, I heard a loud voice speaking from the throne. Now God's home is with human beings. He will live with them and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and, be, and he will be their God. I think that sounds like a perfect kind of situation, doesn't it? And there's other passages. Jeremiah 32, Ezekiel 37, Zechariah 8, Hebrews 8, 10. Lots of places in the Bible. Adam and Eve walked. And here's our conundrum. Adam and Eve walked comfortably with God in his very presence. But God told Moses that no one could see him and live. Exodus, and we can just read that really quick. Then Moses requested, please let me see the dazzling light of your presence. The Lord answered, I will make all my splendor pass before you, and in your presence I will pronounce my sacred name. I am the Lord, and I show compassion and pity on those I choose. I will not let you see my face, because no one can see me and stay alive. But here is a place beside me where you can stand on a rock. When the dazzling light of my presence passes by, I will put you in, the, in an opening in the rock and cover you with my hand until I pass by. Then I will take my hand away, and you will see my back, but not my face." What was that all about? Not Adam sure. and Adam and Eve uh, were different than they were when they came out of Eden. Okay. So the question is, but, but Adam and Eve, even after they sinned, talked to God face to face. Mm -hmm. They communed with Him. Yes. So the question is, what happened to us between the days of Adam and Eve and Moses that made it impossible for us to see God without perishing? Did Cain and Abel 
I don't know. I wasn't there. I don't think the Bible says. I don't think it says either, but I would bet that they, they were not able to see God face to face. They, they were, they, Abraham did. Yeah. Abraham walked he, with they, God. They Nick walked with God. Yeah. They saw God in probably in a human form. Yes. He came a lot. Well, Abraham died, but, and was then translated, but. No, Abraham wasn't translated. But the thing, the thing, the point is that what happens to us with sin? But what has sin done to us? That's yes. the question. Yes. What has sin done to us? And that's a huge question, in my opinion, that the Bible doesn't really answer. And maybe it's too complicated. Maybe try to explain the physiologic, the whatever, mental, spiritual things is too complicated. I don't is know. Is it something like a, a person that has cancer and then they get that cured, but they get another cancer mm -hmm. and multiple to the point that their system cannot tolerate things. And we have sinned so much. Maybe Abraham didn't sin as much as well, Enoch, for whenever sure. Whenever a person sees something, you think you you think you know plenty about it. You, 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 mm -hmm. you re don't realize that there's a lot lot going on that you, that's one way. Because what isn't, Jesus says, nobody's seen the Father except for the one that came from the well, Father. Well, I was going to read that to you. Okay. John 1, 18, <laughs> no one has ever seen God. The only Son who's the same as God and is at the Father's side, He has made Him known. Yeah. So uh, if, 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 and if, if God was standing here and we know He's looking over us all the time, how are we really going to act? You really show your character when you think he ain't looking. <laughs> yeah. Right? Isn't that human nature? But, but he is looking. Yeah, but yes. we don't think in those terms. Yeah. If we, oh. We'd be somewhat, we'd be I grew not just somewhat that. paranoid. Remember, God is watching you. Yes. Uh, everything I did, remember, God is watching okay. you. Okay. Has God's attitude toward us changed? Or have we changed? We've changed. And if we have changed, what has changed in us? Those are the questions I'd like to see answered. But the day will come when we will, see, we will be able to clearly see God. That's mine, I think. Matthew 5, 8. Happy are the pure in heart, they will see God. And those are words of Jesus himself. Then 1 John 3, 2 and 3 says, My dear friends, we are now God's children, but it is not yet clear what we shall become. We know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he really is. Everyone who has this hope in Christ keeps himself pure just as Christ is pure. Good news, Bible. Are Revelation. Are we be surprised by what we see? I mean, yeah, it I think sound so. like what he really is, not what we think he is. Yeah, I mean, we can't possibly yeah. clearly and fully, completely comprehend from our, in our human nature what God is like. So, yeah, I think there's going to be a lot of surprises. Revelation 22, 3 and 4 tells us, nothing that is under God's curse will be found in the city. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city, and His servants will worship Him. They will see His face, and His name will be written on their foreheads. His name will be written on their foreheads. So there's another question. How does that happen? Do you look forward to seeing the face of God the Father? Will we be able to give him a hug? How about the Holy Spirit? Not sure? You don't need to see him. Yeah. It's not necessary. That's, we're talking finite terms. And the sad part of it, when you see something, you think, like I said before, you think that's all there is. It's, uh, no, but there are lots of verses that say we will see him. Yeah, but whether you're actually going to see the Father, are you going to see the infinite? I mean, that there again, we're talking in, in finite yeah. terms. How can you see the infinite? How, the, the infinite has to communicate in finite terms to finite beings. So. Okay. Uh, Jim, I guess you get the next one, the people okay. of God. From Ellen White, she says, the people of God are privileged to hold open communion with the Father and the Son. Now we see through 
a glass darkly, 1 Corinthians 13, 12. We behold the image of God reflected as in a mirror in the works of nature and in his dealings with men. But then we shall see him face to face without a dimming veil between. We shall stand in his presence and behold the glory of his countenance. Ellen White, Great Controversy, page 676 and 77. Stand in his presence and behold the glory of his countenance. Wow. Well, we just read Matthew 5, 8 and 1 John 3, 3 suggests that we must be pure before we can see God. What does that mean? 1 Peter 1, 22 says, Now that by your obedience to the truth you have purified yourselves and have come to have a sincere love for your fellow believers, love one another earnestly with all your heart. Good News Bible. Life can sometimes be very discouraging, very hard, and almost intolerable, but we have promises that things will be very different in the future. <clears throat> Isaiah 25, 8. The Sovereign Lord will destroy death forever. He will wipe away the tears of everyone <coughs> from everyone's eyes and take away the disgrace his people have suffered throughout the world. The Lord himself has spoken. Good News Bible. And in Revelation 21, 4, um, the voice from the throne of God said, He will wipe away all the tears from their eyes. There will be no more death, no more grief or crying or pain. The old things have disappeared. That's so, the good news Bible. Yeah. From our Bible study guide, if the theory of an eternally burning hell were true, then the second death would not eradicate sin as sinners would... Uh, from the universe b and would not eradicate sin and sinners from the universe, but only confine them in an everlasting hell of, of sorrow and crying. And further, in this case, the universe would never be fully restored to its original perfection. But praise the Lord that the Bible paints a completely different picture from our Bible study guide for Wednesday. Is that why God's described as a consuming fire rather mm -hmm. than a perpetual, never-ending fire. Yeah. Do you believe that God's judgment will be fully transparent and yes. completely fair? Absolutely. Would it be fair to condemn someone who had lived a careless life on this earth for a few years to an eternity of ever-burning hell? I mean, that's just unbelievable. But the, it gets people to part with their fire insurance premiums. Well, yeah. <laughs> Offerings. Certainly gets <laughs> yes, the offers filled. The good news is that after the events of the third coming, death itself will perish forever. So why do we believe that God's judgment will be perfectly fair? Because each person will judge himself, herself. Notice these very important statements about the attitude of the wicked toward God and his future kingdom. Is this mine? Mm -hmm. We can trust that in the final judgment, God will treat every single human being with fairness and love. All our loved ones who died in Christ will be raised from the dead to be with us throughout eternity. Those unworthy of eternal life will finally cease to exist without having to live in an unpleasant heaven or an ever-burning hell. From the Bible Study Guide for December 28th. Do we understand clearly that everyone who would be, un would be comfortable in heaven will be there? Everyone who would be comfortable in heaven will be there. Okay, Gordon? Ellen White in Great Controversy 670 says, Satan sees that his voluntary rebellion has unfitted him for heaven. He has trained his powers to war against God. The purity, peace, and harmony of heaven would be to him supreme torture. He would, he would not be comfortable there, right? It would be torture. His accusations against the mercy and justice of God are now, are now silenced. The reproach which he has endeavored to cast upon, Jehovah's, uh, upon Jehovah rests wholly upon himself. And now Satan bows down and confesses the justice of his sentence. And Ellen White from Great Controversy, another section, 542. A life of rebellion against God has unfitted them, that is the wicked, for heaven. Its purity, holiness, and peace 
would be torture to them. The glory of God would be a consuming fire. They would long to flee from the holy place. Can you imagine that they would want to get out of heaven? Well, keep reading. They would welcome destruction that they might be hidden from the face of him who died to redeem them. The destiny of the wicked is fixed by their own choice. Their exclusion from heaven is voluntary with themselves and just and merciful on the part of God. Wow. We, we're going to, I think we're going to come up to it here. Yeah. Look at the next, next paragraph there. In effect, each person will judge himself or herself. Notice what it says in Revelation 6, 16. Myra, I'm going to actually read that. The wicked will do what? Uh, you have okay, to. Okay, I have to. I'm sorry. Revelation I, 6. I can read it. Okay. They called out to the mountains and to the rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the eyes of the one who sits on the throne and from the anger of the Lamb. So, what is that saying? Are they, are they, do they want to go to heaven? Yeah. Oh. They're asking for destruction. Why did God say in Isaiah 65, 17 that, quote, the former things will not be remembered nor will they come to mind? A number of passages suggest that not even God will choose to remember the bad things. That does not mean that the plan of salvation or the great controversy will be forgotten. It will be our study throughout eternity. People will say, and this is just my putting words in their mouths, but this is the idea, why should we talk about those past problems when we can talk about all the wonderful things that we are experiencing here in heaven? And Ellen White, you know, talks about when you think you've discovered everything, God, all of a sudden you realize there's a whole lot more. If there's going to be no end of it. So now, Myra, I'll ask you read That's that. Kind of like my children who wanted to, Dad, tell me about the brain. Mm -hmm. So I started telling <laughs> them, and they said, That's a whole lot more than I wanted to know. <laughs> but later, they may want to know. Yes, okay. I won't remember. Uh, from Ellen G. White, uh, this is Signs of the Times, December 30, 1889. The plan of salvation making manifest the justice and love of God provides an eternal safeguard against defection in unfallen worlds, as well as among those who shall be redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Only our hope is perfect. Our only hope. Our, uh, yes. Our only hope is perfect trust in the blood of Him who can save to the utmost all that come unto God by him. Okay. And then uh, again in Great Controversy, Ellen G. White says, Satan's rebellion has to be a lesson to the universe through all the coming ages, a perpetual testimony to the nature and the terrible results of sin. The working out of Satan's rule, its effects upon both men and angels, would show that it, what, mu what must be the fruit of setting aside the divine authority. Thus, the history of this terrible experiment of rebellion was to be a perpetual safeguard. There it is again. Yes. Perpetual safeguard to all holy intelligences to prevent them from being deceived as to the nature of transgression, to save them from committing sin and suffering its punishments. Wow. Great Controversy, page 499. I'll go ahead there. Okay. So clearly we've talked about a perpetual safeguard. We've talked about a... Uh, perpetual testimony. Perpetual testimony. The cross of Christ will be the science and the song of the redeemed to all eternity. That should take care of it, shouldn't it? In Christ glorified, they will behold Christ crucified. Never will it be forgotten that he whose power created and upheld the unnumbered worlds through the vast realms of space, the beloved of God, the majesty of heaven, he whom cherub and shining seraph de delighted to adore, humbled himself to uplift fallen man, that he bore the guilt and shame of sin and the hiding of his father's face till the woes of a lost world broke his heart and crushed out his life on Calvary's cross. 
that the maker of all worlds, the arbiter of all destinies, should lay aside his glory and humiliate, him, humiliate himself from love to man will ever excite the wonder and adoration of the universe. Greg Honor, verse 651. So we will remember some things. Yes. Well, the plan of salvation is going to be our study for the rest of eternity. Yeah. yeah. So when they say you won't remember anything, it's... it's there, there are statements that sort of suggest, you know, you won't remember. I think it... I've struggled with that a lot in my own mind. I, the way I put it together is I think we're not going to see, oh, you were the one who did this or you did the one, but there, we're going to see the whole picture. We're going to see the evil that happened. We're going to see the good that happened. We're going to see how it all worked out together without probably pointing any fingers at, I mean, I don't think we're going to go around and keep pointing fingers at Eve saying, you, you were the one who ate the fruit. <laughs> <laughs> and Adam, you followed her. Right. What kind of people will inherit the kingdom of God? Revelation 22, 3 to 5. Nothing that is under God's curse will be found in the city. And we're sort of back to the Deuteronomy 28, Leviticus 26 kind of stuff, the blessings and the curses. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city, and his, servant will worship, his servants will worship him. They will see his face, and his name will be written on their foreheads. What does it mean to have his name written on the forehead? What does the forehead represent? Where they do their thinking. Where people do their thinking, right. There shall be no more night and they will not need lamps or sunlight because the Lord God will be their light and they will rule as kings forever and ever. Think of all that God has done to try to save as many of his children as possible. To say, have God's name written on our foreheads means to think and act like him. Jim? From the Bible Study Guide, at the center of the plan of salvation is the promise of eternal life based on the merits of Jesus to all who accept by faith the great provision supplied at the cross. Before the cross, after the cross, salvation has always been by faith and never by works. However, much work, excuse me, much works are an expression of our salvation. However much works are expression of our salvation. Okay. No, sorry. Okay. Paul wrote about Abraham, who existed long before the coming of Christ, as an example of salvation by faith. For if Abraham had justified, was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Romans 3, excuse me, Romans 4, 2, and 3 from the New King James Version. How do these verses help us understand what salvation by faith is all about? The Bible Study Guide for December 29. Okay. Romans 4, 2 to 3. If he was put right with God by things he did, he would have something to boast about, but not in God's sight. The scripture says Abraham believed God and because of his faith accepted him as God right. Accepted, him. accepted God as right. Excuse me, God accepted him as righteous, excuse me. Okay, <clears throat> now we know from other places that the only way to make a transform, to transform a person's life is for them to open up their minds and their thinking to God. God only can make the changes. We, have, we cannot make those changes ourselves. Well, ultimately, what God wants, it, it, we use the term faith, but another way of saying it is persuasion. Yeah. And that pr to be pers comes persuaded is a process. God communicates through words and a process that you can choose either to listen to him yeah. or reject him. Yeah, if you look at Romans 14, 23, it says that faith and sin are opposites. Yeah. As you move closer to God, that's faith. As you move away from God, that's sin. Back and forth, let's hope it's not back and forth. Okay, thus we can have the assurance of salvation if we have accepted Jesus, have surrendered to him, and have claimed his promises, including those of a new life now in him. And if we lean totally on his merits and nothing else. Okay, I'm going to ask you to tell me what that means. Abraham believed and it was, accounted, and it was accounted to him his righteousness. It works the same with us. 
This, then, is what it means to have his name written on our foreheads. If we have it written there, now, and don't turn away from him, then it will be written there in the new heavens and the new earth as well, for my Bible study guide for Thursday. So, what does it mean to lean totally on his Christ's merits and nothing else? Well, here's the challenge, uh, and I, I recognize the challenge that they work with. The, bio, the people who put together these lessons, they have to recognize that there are people who have very forensic ideas about salvation. There's people who have other kinds of ideas about salvation. And so they, I hope, try to do their very best to sort of give a, a middle-of-the-road thing. And sometimes it says things that we're not very excited about. Where did this idea of merits come from? That's as old as time, so to speak. Remember, the ancient the Catholic idea is that God puts you on a scales, and if the good is, if you have more good it's deeds Jewish than also. bad deeds, what? The Jewish have the same problem. Yeah, more good than bad, then then you're. I mean, if you're more good than bad, you're good. If if you're more bad than good, that's a problem. So what you do is you pray and you ask someone else to who has extra merits to, and Jesus, of course, had the most. You ask him to give some of those merits to you to help balance things back so that you can be saved. Craziness. That's a pagan. Yeah. It is, let's see, to have his name written on our foreheads means that we think and act like he does. From the Bible study guide, it is noteworthy to observe that Isaiah repeatedly declares that God creates heaven and earth, and he pairs these two key words, even though sometimes quite loosely. And there are about 20 references, mostly, yeah. actually all from Isaiah. Only two times in the Hebrew Bible is it stated that the Lord creates, quote, the new heavens and the new earth, end quote. And it is only in Isaiah 65 and 66 specific verses. The other reference is in the New Testament book of Revelation, in Revelation 21, 1. <clears throat> hey. the, the crucial question is whether the above description of Isaiah 65 17 to 25 is a description of the eschatological new heavens and new earth. It becomes clear that Isaiah 65 and 66 does not describe the eschatological picture. Yeah, what does eschatological mean? That's a big, long word. End time. Uh, end time. Eschatos is the Greek word for end times. Yeah, the end time picture of describing, uh, as described in Revelation 21 and 22, because death sin, curse, marriage, and the birth of babies are included. To what situation or event then does Isaiah 65, 17 to 25 refer? Is the question in the Bible study guide, and it answers itself, of course, saying Isaiah 65, 17 to 25 paints the new conditions that will exist in Israel should the people of God live according to God's word. But they didn't, did they? No. God's miniature model of his kingdom would be manifested in Israel. Subsequently, the knowledge about the true God would grow and the possibility of accepting the Messiah would expand. Jerusalem would become a mega capital city. And is that idea around anywhere? Mm. Lots of How uh, many people Christian are, churches now. Yeah. If you go onto YouTube and you look at some people who are talking about end times and so forth, oh boy, yeah. Jerusalem is going to be they're just waiting. They've got plans already for building the new temple and da da da, on and on and on stuff. Okay, the mega capital. Continuing from the uh, Bible study guide, nations would stream to the temple of God to learn about the true living Lord in order to serve and worship Him. And some references. The new heavens and a new earth is a hyperbolic expression or a hyperbole, which means in its context, <clears throat> new conditions of life on earth and points to the restoration of Judah after returning from the Babylonian captivity. This expression describes the ideal conditions for God's people in their land of that time. Isaiah 65 is a pre-picture, foretaste, or type of the antitypical new heavens and new earth, certainly. But what can be applied from it to the description of the eschatological new earth one needs to implement three principles to discover the correct application. 
Okay. The Teacher's Bible Study Guide 185 and 186. In order to clearly understand these last two chapters on Isaiah, we need to keep in mind three key, key interpretive principles. God's ideal plan was that the children of Israel, and we all would recognize this, I think, should live so well in cooperation with him that they would create a little heaven on earth and would later be able to go to heaven in that condition. That would have been perfect. This, of course, did not happen. Isaiah's prophecies, especially in Isaiah 65 and 66, then give us an idea of what the ideal kingdom might have been like. So how much of it will apply to the earth made new when Christians and others who have followed God's way in their lives reach heaven? Okay, one principle. You want to take up the first one, Myra? Sure. Much of what Isaiah talked about, talked about such as joy, happiness, security, peace, prosperity, and creative work will definitely be in heaven as well. We will have new relationships with the animal world. I'm looking forward to that. Crying, pain, sorrow, and suffering will be banished. But there are other aspects of that ideal Israelite kingdom that will not be found in heaven. Principle two, when other writers later in the Bible say they will not be found, something will not be found in, in heaven, then these must be left out. There will, there will be no death, no sin, no sinners or curses. These are mentioned or implied in Isaiah 65 and 66. Revelation tells us of other things that will not be found in heaven. Revelation 21, 8 and 27. Jim? But cowards, traitors, perverts, murderers, the immoral, those who practice magic, those who worship idols, and all liars. The place for them is the lake burning with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. But nothing that is impure will enter the city, nor anyone who does shameful things or tells lies. Only those whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life of the Living will enter the city. Good News Bible. So Jesus said that marriage and the birth of children will not be found in heaven. Gordon? Matthew 22, verses 29 to 32 say, Jesus answered them, How wrong you are! It is because you don't know the Scriptures or God's power. For when the dead rise to life, they will be like angels in heaven and will not marry. But we don't know exactly what the angels in heaven are like, do we? No, we don't. Now, as for the dead rising to life, haven't you ever read what God has told you? He said, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is the God of the living, not of the dead. Good News Bible. And Ellen White says from uh, Selected Messages, there are men today who express the belief that there will be marriages and births in the new earth. But, the, but those who believe the scriptures cannot accept such doctrines. The doctrine that children will be born in the new earth is not a part of the sure word of prophecy. 2 Peter 1.19 The words of Christ are too plain to be misunderstood. They should forever settle the question of marriages and births in the new earth. Neither these... Neither th those who shall be raised from the dead nor those who shall be translated without seeing death will marry or be given in marriage. They will be as the angels of God, members of the royal family. Written in 1904. So I think what she's trying to suggest there is that we will, we will be very, we'll have wonderful friends from all ages and it will be completely compatible, etc. But we don't need to have well, I'm married to this person, and, and that's different than anybody else. I think she's trying to apply that we'll have wonderful relationships with all kinds of people. Well, principle three. There's, go ahead. Okay. Principle three. There are other things that Isaiah did not talk about, which will be found in the new kingdom. One, the new Jerusalem will descend from heaven, Revelation 21, 2 and 3. God himself, too, God himself will come down with the city to live on this earth. Revelation 22, 1 and 3. And number three is God's physical presence will be visible to all of us and he will dwell with his people. Revelation 22, 4 and 5. 
So Isaiah ends with a somewhat puzzling passage, Isaiah 66, 22 to 24, just as the new earth and the new heavens will endure by my power, so your descendants in your name will, uh, your name will endure. On every new moon festival and every Sabbath, people of every nation will come to worship me here in Jerusalem, says the Lord. As they leave, they will see the dead bodies of those who have, been, who have rebelled against me. The worms that eat them will never die, and the fire that burns them will never be put out. The sight of them will be disgusting to the whole human race. Did Isaiah really need to end with that? However, we should notice carefully that, that this passage follows Isaiah 66, 19 to 21, an intensive evangelistic campaign. When, um, when they come together, they will see what my power can do and will know that I am the one who punishes them. But I will spare some of them and send them to the nations in the distant lands that have not heard of my name or seen my greatness and power, to Spain, Libya, and Lydia, with its skilled archers, and to the Tubal and Greece. Among these nations they will proclaim my greatness. They will bring back all your fellow Israelites from the nations as a gift to me. They will bring them to my sacred hill in Jerusalem on horses, mules, and camels, and in the chariots and wagons, just as Israelites bring grain offerings to the temple in ritually clean containers. I will make some of them priests and Levites. Gentiles will become priests and Levites? Clearly, these passages are referring to the ideal Jerusalem that Isaiah saw in vision. There are many other passages that give us some details of what the heavenly kingdom will be like. For example, Daniel 2, Daniel 7 and 9, Isaiah 24 to 27, Ezekiel 38 and 39, Ezekiel 40 to 48, Joel 3, Micah uh, 4, and Zechariah 14. Notice this brief story that might give us a clue as to what the future kingdom will be like. Beloved author and preacher Dean, Dean Frederick Farrar was a personal friend of an honorary chaplain to Queen Victoria in the 1870s. One day, the chaplain preached a sermon on the second coming of Christ. As he spoke of the, that glorious event, he noticed tears in the eyes of the queen. And I'm going to drop down. She said, because I, why do you have tears? I do hope that he will come in my day. Why did his majesty desire that he should come in your day? The chaplain asked. I, may, I want to lay down my crown at his feet. Let's pray. Our kind and loving Father, we thank you for these revelations of, in, in, in feeble human terms, of what that marvelous future life will be life and the marvelous land that you have prepared for us. The animals, all living together in peace and harmony, etc. What a wonderful day it will be. May it come soon is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.